Hasn't this been the best weekend? <laughs> Isn't it great to be together? Great to have the weather, great to have the sunshine, great to have such a wonderful lineup of writers and events. So um, it, it's been a delight to be here for most of the weekend. We are, of course, on Darkenjong land, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I think you've done all the housekeeping, except perhaps all those phones are on silent, are they not? But you're all social media gurus, so you're all tweeting and on Instagram and on Facebook. So uh, when you're Instagramming and tweeting and Facebooking, could you use the handles at Words on the Waves or the um, hashtag Words on the Waves? We're going to have questions for you. I'm not going to monopolise um, Chris and Brian for the whole hour. So have them ready. And of course, Chris and Brian will be selling the, signing their books in the bookshop. So please come and join us and say hi. Some introductions. Brian Brown, a little known Australian actor. <laughs> having come to international attention with performances in Break a Morant, A Town Like Alice, which made me sob. The Thornbirds, which made me sob. Australia, which made me sob and wish I was Nicole Kidman. Beautiful Kate, which I think is probably the, the best of the lot. A fabulous film. Gorillas in the Mist, which I haven't seen. All in all, more than 80 films. In 2018, Brian was awarded the Longford Lyle Award, recognising his contribution to Australian cinema. This in front of us is Sweet Jimmy, which is Brian's first book. Welcome to you, Brian. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. What a delight to be here. I've never been here. I've, I've passed it in the ferry going to... Um, well, I didn't know I was passing it. I mean, I just was sort of in the ferry. But, like, I mean, there's Palmy and there's Lion Island. You know, God, it's a secret, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty cool. Good, good on you. <laughs> What's that? It's a secret. Be careful who you tell. I, I, I'm not. I'm not going to tell anyone. Ha. <laughs> Just to remind everybody, we were being recorded today, so everybody will soon know the secrets that you want kept. It's a horrible place, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and now. When order's restored, let me introduce you to Chris Hammer, who was a journalist for more than 30 years, dividing his career between covering Australian federal politics, interesting stuff, and international affairs. For many years, he was a roving foreign correspondent for the SBS current affairs program, Dateland. Dateline. <laughs> Dateline. I haven't, I haven't seen Dateland. His first novel, Scrublands, won the UK Debut Dagger Award, and his subsequent novels, Silver and Trust, have been listed for many prizes, with Trust winning last year's Danger Prize. Chris new, Chris's new novel is this one here, which is Treasure and Dirt. Good afternoon to you, Chris Hammer. Well, how nice it is to be here and to see so many interested and interesting people. So... You're a journalist, Chris, for 30 years, and then suddenly, lo and behold, you're a crime writer with four novels. Why start writing crime? Oh, I got sacked. <laughs> <laughs> it's a well-known fact that if you're looking for money, start writing fiction. <laughs> like... uh, that's the short version. The longer version is, of course, I always had a hankering to write. I'd written two non-fiction books that came out of um, working as a journalist. One was called The River, uh, which is kind of like a travel book. I travelled through the Murray-Darling Basin at the height of the millennial drought, 2008-2009, uh, from the headwaters in Queensland all, way, all the way to the lower lakes in South Australia. And that's where I got the setting for Scrublands, because I spent a week in a little town out in the Western Riverina of New South Wales. That was an irrigation town and whose river was bare. And you imagine an irrigation town without water, how desperate that is. I really liked writing those books. I learned three things. One, I could write a book, because until you try, you don't know. Two, I liked writing a book. And three, you can't make any money out of writing books in Australia. 
So, so Fairfax would have been very generous and given me a redundancy, were then even more generous and hired me back again. But I was working more, um, so for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age in the press gallery in Canberra, but when I went back, I was running more like a video unit. So I wasn't writing as much. So I thought, well, I don't have the time or the money or the resources to do non-fiction. I'll just make something up. And that's how Scrubland started, with the intention of getting published, but with the idea that, you know, you get it published, a few mates come along, slap you on the back, tell you what a good chap you are, and then you go back to your day job. And it was just, I'd given it to an agent. She was trying to broker a deal. I got sacked. I had a meteoric three-week career as a political advisor. And then I quit, because I got this wonderful book deal. So that's how it happened. Yeah, it's, it's like a fairy tale. And that's, of course, as you'll know in the audience, the story for all writers. <laughs> Brian, Who are you a political advisor to? Um, Australia's new assistant treasurer, Stephen Jones. He, when I, <laughs> I said, oh, look, Stephen, I've got something to tell you. Um, I'm quitting. And he went, oh, shit, what have I done? <laughs> No, I, um, I sent him a congrats the other day when he was sworn in, yeah. Brian, you're an actor and a producer, and now you've published this fabulous collection of stories, really around a whole lot of people who find themselves caught up in crime. Did you just wake up one day and think, right, I'm going to put together a collection of short stories now? No, I didn't. I didn't at all. Um, how this collection came about... Uh, surprises the life out of me, as well as uh, every one of my very close friends. Um, about 35 years ago, I had an idea for a, um, a, a film, and uh, it was I called it Nightmare. And I, uh, it was about a, an Australian couple going to America on a, on a uh, hiring a car and going through going through America on that and getting into trouble. <clears throat> And I, I, so I, I started, in, in, instead of just pitching it to the studios, I decided that I'd write a short version of what, th what that, poss that story could be. Anyway, that short version kept going, kept going, going, and eventually <clears throat> I couldn't help but write the whole story. I, wanted, I was enjoying that, but I knew that would be uh, better. So I gave it to my agent in uh, America, and this is about 40 years ago. And the big thing was he read it and he said, well, at least we know one thing, you can write. Now, that was a huge huge, it was actually a wonderful thing to hear because I'd never ever imagined myself as a writer in any way or form. First of all because um, the, the, the subject I hated most at school was English. Um, uh, I, I couldn't connect with English in any way at all, whether it was the way it was taught or whatever, but um, you know, things like great expectations and stuff like that had nothing to do with my life. I couldn't connect with that. Poetry was like, you've got to be joking. Um, <laughs> Uh, there was nothing there. Shakespeare, you know, like, Romeo, Romeo, well, you know, like, why didn't he just say, hey, love, you want to come out and have a kiss in the background? <laughs> you know, like, <clears throat> it didn't connect at all, right? So to hear that someone said, uh, ac actually, a, a little story on this. Uh, so um, the teacher kn knew that I hated English and whatever. Anyway, I did the leaving certificate, <clears throat> but I was a pretty good student and I kn knew how to pass exams because that's all they want you to do, you know, you just got to work out how to do it. Um, and so I actually got an A in English, and when I went back, we all went back to see the teachers, he, the English teacher just looked at me and said, it's not fair. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, <clears throat> long and the short of it. Um, so I wrote that about 40 years ago. Now, um, uh, about three years ago, I was watching the television, and there was this... Um, there was this... Um, uh, I was showing a story about eight, six or eight uh, people, uh, similar age to me, 50, um, <coughs> who were, had just been released from jail and, the, and they were having a celebratory dinner. They didn't know each other, but they'd all been in jail. And the judge had said to them, um, you're not drug mules, you're stupid. And they'd been people that had been caught up in scams and had been put inside. And I was watching that and I thought, if I was one of those people, I'd just have to know who did this to me. I'd have to pursue that. So I thought, ooh, not a bad idea for a, for a show, for a series. So I once again sat down and started to write a story <coughs> about 
someone that had been caught like that and them trying to find out how this happened to them. And so that was the, f that was the first thing I wrote about three years ago. Um, and a couple of people had read it and said, oh, I like the story, it's good. And for some reason then um, I was driving the car one day and I, I was having to think about things and I thought, oh, what if Sam Neill was a thief? And, um, and so just the idea of Sam Neill a thief, Sam a thief, I went, I'm going to write a story about a bloke called Sam who's a thief. <coughs> so, so I was on a bit of a run there. I was like just doing it as an enjoyment. And Richard Walsh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, who, who, the you know, bulletin editor at times and all other things, he happened to get hold of three or four of these stories I'd written and uh, he said, look, um, I, I think Alan and I would like to publish these. And so then it was like, can you write another couple to fill it out? And so the I did and the next minute I had a book called Sweet Jimmy and, uh, and underneath Sweet Jimmy it had Brian Brown and I, every time I walked past it I go, God. He's, he's a clever boy, isn't he? Uh, have you sent one to your old English teacher? <laughs> Died. <laughs> now, Chris, I've always found short stories tricky to write. I've always felt a bit like the 100 metre sprint. You can run you know, a couple of um, times around an oval and if you make a bit of a mistake, it doesn't matter. But the 100 metre sprint, it's got to be perfect. Are you a short story writer, um, no, aspiring or not? I'm too long-winded. I, like, I take my hat off to people who are really... It's a really... In some ways, a novel isn't perfectible. There's too much in it. You, you, get, you can work and work and work at it, but at some point you've got to stop. You know, it's a law of diminishing returns, whereas a short story, you can just kind of crystallise it in a perfect way. I don't think I can do that. <coughs> the... One of the theories with, <coughs> excuse me, books like crime fiction that publishers will say about 90,000 words is the sweet spot. Um, I think that one's about 120. I really like that, as a reader, I really like being immersed in a book. You know, you escape into a book. I'm a bit like that when I write. It's just the other, so, you know, other side of the coin. So I admire short story authors very much, but I, I just don't think I could do it. Okay, a little question for the audience. Uh, who knows Martin Scarsden? Yes, we have some Scarsdens. Mandalay Blonde, ring a bell? Yes. So, um, so Chris Hammer came to international attention with Scrublands and we were introduced to the journalist Martin Scarsden and um, Mandy or Mandalay Blonde. But now, lo and behold, three, four books later, uh, Treasure and Dirt, and I was looking forward to seeing what Martin and Mandy were up to next, but they've been replaced. They've been replaced by Ivan Lukic and Nell Buchanan. For those of the audience who haven't yet immersed themselves in Treasure and Dirt, give us a little bit of introduction to Ivan Lukic, Lukic please. Okay, so Ivan Lukic is a minor character in the first three books. He's the rather surly offsider to the main police character, Morris Montefiore, who's, who's, um, who's investigating the same sort of crimes that Martin is, and sometimes they're cooperating and sometimes they're at cross purposes. What happened is, what happened with Scrublands, when I was writing, I thought, you need to have a cracking plot for a good, successful crime book, and that's pretty much all there is to it. But then as I wrote it, I, I realised there's so much more. I mean, character in many ways is more important than the plot. The setting's really important. And then almost to my own surprise, I realised the, the emotional journey of Martin throughout Scrublands, it's, you know, he's a different man at the end of the book than he is at the start. Uh, he's becoming more self-aware, et cetera, et cetera. And I like that about the book, and that's... That's how I then came to write Silver, because I thought there's more to this bloke. What happened to him as a kid that made him like this? So that Silver, he got in Scrublands he's a total stranger. He doesn't know anyone in the town, right? But in Silver it's the town he grew up in. And you know, where all these traumatic events happened to him as a kid. And so he finds out what really happened. 
then that in turn suggested what about Mandy? So that's what trust is. That's the, her formative years. More in, a, in Sydney in her twenties. Um, <clears throat> but once I'd done that, I thought, well, I can write another crime book with them in it. But the readers, both the readers and myself, had got used to them encountering these, you know, traumatic issues from their past, or you know, discovering new things about themselves. I thought, well, I just can't make something like that up constantly, you know, for 15 books or whatever. It's fine if you've got a Miss Marple or a Poirot or something who's not really invested as just a bit of a cipher to solve a, solve a puzzle. So that's why I thought I'd give them a bit of a rest. And writing the poli- – like, Martin's a journalist, right? And I was a journalist for 30 years, so it's relatively easy and he's – He's based loosely on some of the traumatised foreign correspondents I used to run into off in, you know, various, you know, dodgy places around the globe. But I was never a police reporter, I was never a crime reporter. So it kind of surprised me taking on Ivan and Nell. So Ivan, Ivan is, he, he's a bit damaged too. Um, his, his father, you just get a little mention of, you know, he's got a very dark past. And Ivan's got a bit of a problem with the pokies, um, which sort of looms. Nell is very kind of fresh-faced and keen. She's just a young police officer. In the book, though, they both get into strife. Their careers are in danger for different reasons. So they really need to pull together to try and solve the crimes because that's the only way they, can, they figure that they can get out from under. So anyway, I like, and I'm just in the process now of writing a book. It's, we've just given it the title. Uh, it's called The Tilt and it's, it'll be out in October, but it's again, it's Ivan and Nell because there's more to explore there with them. See, I told you I was long-winded. <laughs> So I was reading Treasure and Dirt and getting used to Ivan and Nell and then then there's Martin Skarsden comes up again. Not him himself, but a reference to him. I'm thinking, he doesn't belong here, does he? Is it important for you, Chris, for your fictional worlds to intersect? Uh, no, no. Important might be overstating it. It's just a lot of fun. And when I was a kid, I really liked, um, you know, those Tintin books. My brother used to collect them. And, you know, you get the same kind of minor characters popping up every three or four books or something like that. I really enjoy that. Oh, another, like a crime writer I, I like very much, uh, Michael Connolly. You know, he's the guy who writes the Harry Bosch books. But then there's a couple of other characters. There's Mickey Haller, who's a lawyer. He's the lawyer in The Lincoln Lawyer. And there's a couple of books with a journo character, um, Jack McAvoy. So sometimes they're the, char- they're the main characters in the books. But in other times they just pop up as, as like a little, you know, in the, in the Conley verse sort of thing. So I think, I, yeah, I kind of like that idea. So, so again, in this book that's coming out in October, there's a character that's in one or two of the previous books and plays a pretty important role. So, yeah, it's a, I don't know, it's just like a fun thing to do. I don't, it's not important, it's just fun. So a bit where's Wally? Sorry? A bit, a bit where's Wally? Who can you, who can you find? Well, well you don't want to... Um, with any kind of crime series, you have to be able to read them as standalones. You know, you, you, I want people to be able to pick up trust and to be able to read it without having read Scrublands or Silver. So you can't do it in a way that that um, you know is predicated on foreknowledge by the reader. They've all got to be able to be read standalone. That sort of brings me back to you, Brian. Uh, Sweet Jimmy is, I think, a very clever collection of books and what I found particularly engaging was you open with a story which introduces us to three brothers, Phil, Jimmy and Johnny Quigley, who are steeped in crime and then in your final story you return to them in a shocking conclusion, I won't say what, that takes us so full circle I had to go straight back to the beginning to see what I'd missed and it becomes a circular structure. Was that something you did deliberately? No, I didn't. Um, I'd, 
I wrote the first one, um, Boys Will Be Killers. And <clears throat> when I got to the end of it, I thought, you know, I can go further with this story. I, I, there's more to this story. That's a conclusion. But I, I think I want to go further with it. So I wrote, the second one was called Sweet Jimmy, the second part of it. The publishers said, let's shove that at the end. Yeah. And I went, well, you know, you're the publisher. You, you know, if you think that's a good idea. I didn't know if it was a good idea or not. Um, but, but, but I thought, it, was a, I thought it, was a, it, it, would, it could work that way. I was worried that people would get to then go, oh, I've got to go back to the first bloody book, uh, story now to remember what, why that was. So I was a bit worried about that. But, um, it, you know, it's a short book, so it's not far to go back to, you know. <laughs> no, I must say, to get me to read a book for a second time straight away, straight off, um, takes a bit because there's a lot of books I've got to read or a lot of books that I want to read. But um, I, was, I was running in the morning, I was listening to the, the audio book of Sweet Jimmy and, of course, Brian narrates that and you can imagine he narrates it beautifully. And um, I got to the end and just stopped and thought, no. <laughs> and then went right back to the beginning and spent the rest of the run listening to the first story right. to see who and how and when. And, and I really think that structure for a short story collection is important because sometimes you read short stories that don't seem to belong together. And, and I think it was a brilliant decision to send you back again and around and yeah, around. Yeah, I think, it, I think it helps in terms of, uh, of a, a collection of short stories to be tied up in, in some way. And so I was very grateful that they knew what they were talking about and, and did it that way, yeah. While we're with the Quigley boys, where did you get the inspiration for these boys? Tell <clears> us a bit about them. Well, look, uh, I, think, I think the interesting thing for me about all this is that, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've spent... Um, nearly 50 years telling stories as an actor and producing stories and that, you know, like, so <clears throat> I love, obviously I love telling stories. I love being a part of stories. I love working with writers, you know, working through a draft and going, okay, until we get first, second, third, um, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, to the ending. I, I love all that. I love that, you know, and, and with a film script, it's four, it'll take you at least four years, you know, with the drafts and backwards and forwards and try this, that doesn't work, let's drop that character, bring that character in, all this sort of stuff. So I really enjoy the process of, of trying to make a story work uh, that people can a a enjoy. So I've, 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 I, I like that process. I like telling stories. In doing this, I think what it's given me the chance to do is to go right back to my growing up and to examine different, like, I've been a very lucky boy. I grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney. I was only thinking the other day, uh, I'm coming out here to this, to this festival and, I'm, uh, you know, I did Sydney, I'm going to do Byron and I'm driving the car and I'm thinking, mate, there's no way in the world, when you were 12 years of age in Panania, did you ever think you were going to do 80 movies? Did you ever think that, you know, you're going to marry the girl from the Thornbirds? Did you, did, <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever think you were going to write a book that, you know, people will sit there and listen to you ramble on about? No. You know, so it, in a way, this, it, the, 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 when I started to come to, tell, to write my own stories, they were sort of a reflection on <clears throat> either incidents that... I, I think the biggest thing... That, that, that I, like, you hang on to things, you know, like, I, I, I'm sure you've had this, this occasion where you go, you, you, there's something about someone you think, oh, I've got to apologise to them, you know, that happened 40 years ago. Oh, I must apologise. Then you apologise, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, like, you've held this thing, you know, and, 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 and one of the big ones of that is guilt, you know, like, oh, my God, you know, like, I think the, the number of things I wish, can I just go back and not do that? You know, can I not be that bully at school that I was that day? Um, and those, so those things resonate, particularly as you get older, I think, you know. So it gave me the opportunity, this, to go back to things I observed that, that, that sort of... Um, that, that I didn't quite understand. And so I picked the... A, in this, this one, Boys Will Be Killers. When I was a young man, I used to surf at Cronulla. Um, I didn't live at Cronulla, but I used to go out to Cronulla to surf. And the area where I, my mates and I surfed, on a Saturday morning, usually at about 10 o'clock, these two brothers would come down and, to have a surf there. And we got to know them. But every weekend they'd come down and they had on a new jacket or a new 
T-shirt or something, and they had walked into surf, dive and ski and just stolen them and walked out. Now, <coughs> now, part of me loved that fact about them. You know, it was like, wow, that's sort of so exciting. That's, but another part of me was like, but it's wrong. You know, but I still couldn't get over the fact that it, 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 it was, it, you know, those boys were like, wow, they game enough to do that? That's really... And so, and through the years, quite truthfully, at different times I've gone back and gone, what happened to those blokes? What happened to those blokes? Now, it could be that, you know, they, they, they you know, two years after I'd known them, they woke up to themselves and went, you know, one became a lawyer and one became something else. Who knows? They went on to a lawyer. But maybe, maybe not. Maybe that, those things that seemed a bit larrikin or above larrikin led to something else and then the, a cop got them and then the next minute you're on a bond and then the next minute you're inside and the life is dark. So I decided on the life was dark. Um, I wanted, so I took those two boys and... It, the, the fact that I knew those two boys and saw a moral, something that was morally um, questionable to me and take, take them and tell a story called Boys Will Be Killers and Sweet Jimmy and that's, how, that's where those characters came from. <clears throat> that's really interesting when you say you go back to your childhood and work out what happened to those boys you left there. I used to work as a criminal lawyer and so for me it's been the opposite. Uh, I've seen people in jail at uh, the ages of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And I suppose as a writer, my view has been, or my thoughts have been, what got you here? So we come from two ends of the yeah. spectrum. Indeed. In fact, um, one of your characters reminds me very much of um, some of the people that um, uh, I've encountered in my career. And the character that I think most interests me in your collection is Frank Testy. Tell me about Frank Testy. Well, Frank Testy is to do with that story I was telling you about the, the, the celebratory dinner and the, the eight people who had been caught up in scams and, and the f fact that if that was me, I'd have to, I'd have to uh, find out who did this to me. So in so doing, I, 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 I came up with a character called Frank Testy. And I had to give Frank... If Frank was going to pursue this and it was going to be a really hard pursuit because he had nothing to go on, uh, to, except, you know, the, the, the scam that he got involved with with this lady. But where she was, he would never know in his life. So if he was going to do this, he needed to have something. He needed... I had to give him something. He wasn't a cop. So I had to... I had to give... What I gave him was he had to have persistence and he had to have discipline. And I went, OK, what sort of bloke has that? Uh, you know, many. But I went, he's a swimmer. He's coached swimming. He's been a good swimmer. He swims every day from North Bondi to South Bondi to North Bondi. And so, so, so he, was, he was someone that wouldn't give up. And he was going to meet dead ends, dead ends, dead ends. But he had to keep pushing through those dead ends. And, 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 and I think the... Uh, I, I think the, 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 the symbolism, too, of the swimming, that, that and, and, and water, because Sydney is such a water city, and, it, and it's all set, it's set in Bondi and around there and, and, and out west, but um, I just think that water means so much to us. I mean, uh, and, 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 and swimming means so much to us, and we love it, our, our, you know, when our swimmers do well, you know, like... Um, and, and so to, to make Frank a... Uh, uh, a coach of the Australian swimming squad um, who is now, um, uh, you know, a, of a certain age, the one thing he can rely on is he's persistent and he's got discipline because he says, you know, you can be talented as you like but without discipline you're fucked. In well, all your books you focus also on women but often on the Australian man. And I'm just going to ask a question to each of you. Um, what is it about <laughs> blokes, Chris Hammer, I'm looking at you, <laughs> that, that brings you back to a particular Australian male such as Martin Scarsden and now someone like Ivan? So, so in the book that's coming out in October, there's three point of view characters. There's um, Nell, who's a 20-something police officer. There's a teenage girl and there's a boy. 
<laughs> so, well, it's a 90-year-old man remembering when he was a boy. So that's, it's a bit of a departure because it doesn't have that. And I, Ivan is in the book and is important, but he's not a point of view character. Um, I think as Australian... Well, Australians are just uh, uh, interesting, particularly ones where, that are conflicted. And uh, Australian men have this way of being conflicted where they don't talk about it. And that makes for an interesting sort of tension in a book and it gives room for people to explore and it probably means that most readers can read your book and kind of think, yeah, I, I, I know this character or I know a character, you know, someone in real life like them. So it gets back to what I was saying before. You think the crime book is all about the plot and the whodunit type of element, but I think character is far more important. And when I set out writing Scrublands, which was just like a bit of a hobby project, one of the first things I decided is I'm not going to have black and white sort of characters. I'm not going to have goodies that are extra good and baddies that are just bad. You know, if people do bad things, why do they do bad things? If people are doing good things, why are they doing good things? Why do they... Why do they so, so Martin, for example, uh, will do some ethically sort of questionable things, you know, as not that any real-life journalist would ever do that. <laughs> Um, it's a good question. It's, I, I just find it interesting to explore. Brian, um, in my career I've mostly acted for men rather than for women because it's mostly men who end up in prison, at least in the criminal law part of, of my job. And in your collection of short stories, there are women, but it's mostly men and mostly men who get themselves in trouble. Why, why this focus? Um... <clears throat> Well, there's some glib answers to that, you know, like, I'm a man, I sort of understand me. Um, I've played a lot of Australian blokes. I enjoy playing them. The thing that Chris mentioned there about uh, Australian men keep it inside and whatever, I'd much prefer to play characters like that than hysterical sort of demonstrative characters. I think... Um, I think that they're intriguing. Australian women fall from. Um, I find it interesting, like when I when I first went over to America and stuff, like, and when I've watched uh, Aussie blokes uh, in America and stuff, like, and you'll see them at a party, you know, like, and and uh, uh, you know they they're quiet or whatever they crack a little bit of an ironic joke or something, you know, like, and everyone will be hanging around some girl there and the bloke that walks out with is usually the Australian bloke. Um, I, remember, I remember my wife saying to me, like, um, um, God, you dressed so badly and, um, um, and, um, and, and you know, like, um, you were so slow. And I went, well, who got you? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, so... You know, I, 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 there's something intriguing about this Australian, this Australian male character. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not talking good, bad or anything here. You know, like, um, I like the irony that's been given to us by the, the English and the Irish. Um, you go to America, everything's very literal. You know, you, you, you say something about, oh, <laughs> that bastard, and they think you didn't like him. Well, it's your best friend, you know. Um, so that, that, that sort of, that, that I, I enjoy that game that we play, that ironic game we play between ourselves and stuff. I think, um, 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 and I, I, you know, I, I, actually in my book there, there, there are some women, you know, um, no, they're, 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 you know, like there's one there about a young girl that gets terribly into trouble with drugs and it's the, the, the man, um, Ahmed, who, who, who helps her, who you don't think would be the type to help her, you know, and I... I'm, 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 I mean, the, the, there's so many different types of Australian men, but I do a, 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 a bit of, I'm, I'm in, involved with a place called Addy Road at Marrickville, which is a, a centre for, um, for, um, for, uh, for all sorts of refugees, for, uh, for people that don't have any, <coughs> any, can't afford food and stuff like that. And um, 
when I'm down there, and we, we pack boxes with, with food and everything, you know, I'm really good at it. Um, and um, uh, in fact, they put a sticker out going, this, this, this is been certified by Brian Brown, because I'm the chief packer. I'm really, I'm re I'm really very good packer. A anyway, um, <coughs> but the people I meet down there, the men that I meet down there, and in the main, they're men. There's a bloke there who was, a, who was retired, he was a French teacher of Cranbrook for 30 years. There's another bloke who eventually, I suddenly realised he was a, he'd been a psychologist. All this. There's all these different sorts of men down there. So, you know, when I say I like playing Australian men, there's so many different types of them. But I guess I like the, I like the fact we, we don't shove our emotions out there. We, tr we, you know, for whatever reason, I sort of like that and I like the irony that it, that's involved in our, our, in our character. Um, and I think we're funny. <laughs> you know, I think we're pretty funny. You know, like, we're, we're, we're quite silly and stupid. You know, and I quite like that. You know. So, Ron, let's take you back to the, the quiet, ironic Australian who's living in America in a country of the literal, or many literal. So, when you were there, or when you are there, do you play the literal game? Do you change your persona so the Americans understand you, or do you just um, go in hard? Oh, I thought my strength was my difference, you know. And look, you can't pretend, you know. You, you are what you are, you know. So, like, uh, either uh, some people were interested in buying that, and some people probably weren't. But, you know, like, it was, it was, it was uh, you know, it's all, for me, you know, I was a lucky bloke. I fell into the arts at, at 20, at, in my early 20s. I got involved in this game called Expression. I was an actuarial student at the AMP, big place down in Sydney, and they had a drama club. And I said to a mate of mine, and they were asking people to come down at the, to the end of year review, you know, uh, to audition. And I said to this mate of mine, who was a bit of a larrikin, I said, um, mate, we ought to go down and audition here. I said, because there's got to be some girls we haven't met yet. <laughs> <coughs> and, you know, let's get it right. Sex drives the world. You know, it drove me, to, the, it drove me to, a, to a drama club. But when they handed me this piece of paper, they handed us both a piece of paper, and they said, uh, in a minute, just read this, and in a minute we'll get you to stand up and read it with someone, you know. And so um, my mate freaked. He went, oh, I'm out of here. I didn't. I read it, and I got up, and I read it opposite someone, and they said... Okay, you can, you can join. Um, and we've got rehearsals tomorrow, uh, straight after work. And it was the first day I'd ever gone to... I, I was a happy bloke. It was the first day I couldn't wait to go to work. Because at the end of work, there was going to be this f very strange thing called rehearsals. That all I knew was I liked it. That's all I knew. I didn't know whether... anything. But, like, for some reason, it was allowing me to express myself as a 20-year-old, 21-year-old, that I'd never been able to express in any other way, you know. So, um, so th this form of expression, you know, that, 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 that I landed in in the arts and it, it, that, he's, that Chris has landed in in the arts, you know, I think it's about being able to stay playful in a way, you know, that you can, pr you can, you can create, you can imagine and get paid for it, sometimes well and sometimes really terribly. Uh, Terrible. But it, it, that, that thing of playing, I found a place I could keep playing and writing stories is a place I can play at as well. Before I turn to Chris, I've got a bit of a this is your life moment, Brian. Do you remember the this is your life? Do you remember the, um, the show? Yeah. So, you were talking about the AMP theatre. You won't believe this, but my aunt was in the AMP when you were in the AMP theatre and you and my aunt, Marie Sully, appeared on stage for 15 minutes, her as a cleaner, she was also a dancer, and you as something I didn't ask about. <laughs> That's great. Isn't it? That's great. Isn't it? Who would have thunk it? That's great. That great little AMP AMP theaterette. That, um, that's where we performed our um, end of the year review. Um, wow, that's great. Isn't it? Hey, we're sort of bonded. Yeah, we have. <laughs> but now, um, Chris, we're going to turn to more serious matters. Chris, religious, religion is a strong motif in your work. Scrublands opens with the local priest, those who have read it will know, opening fire after a church service, and in Treasure and Dirt, 
an opal miner is found crucified. That's no spoiler, is it? It happens early. No, no, that's fine. In an opal mine. What keeps you coming back to religious issues, Chris? I have no idea. <laughs> um, I'm not religious. I have, as a journalist, I have occasionally done stories concerning uh, cults. I got beaten up one time and I was doing a story on the exclusive brethren in New Zealand. Um, but I was holding a camera at the time, so it made brilliant television. It was kind of almost worth it. And I uh, know oh it was worth it. Um, but the better one was in, in um, Nashville. I was actually overdoing some serious foreign policy type, you know. But a producer rang, something fell through and they said, look, if you and the camera guys can go and do this story, and it was, it was actually a really good story. This woman had started a weight loss program. You know, like think Weight Watch or something like that. But she tied it to religion. And it was called, I forget the name. Anyway, the, the, their catch selling was Thin For Him. <laughs> and the message was, fat people didn't get into heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't matter whatever shit you'd done, you know. <laughs> but if you're fat, you weren't getting in. <laughs> you know, you're going downstairs. And then she'd had, it all went, she made millions. She was a millionaire because the churches would let her people use their church halls during the week. And they thought they were doing a service for their, uh, for their parishioners, right? So you, you run into, you know, t every now and then you run into the, and, and more, more seriously, you know, I reported from Bosnia in the 1990s and religion was really tied up in that war. It was used by some incredibly nasty and exploitative people. You know, you had the Catholics versus the Orthodox Christians versus the Muslims. So it's tied up. So I guess it's in the background. I had a... My, my parents were, um, were religious, but I, I'm not lapsed. I never was. So it, it's kind of an interesting question. I do... Your observation is perfectly correct. It sort of cops up in the books, not in all of them, not in this new one, but see, I'm, I can't really explain why. For those of you who haven't read Treasure and Dirt, I'll say two words, the rapture and the seer. Um, that'll, that's a fabulous, uh, fabulous oh, cult. Can, can, I, yes. can I just... So it's, Treasure and Dirt is set in an opal mining town and it's kind of like a fictionalised version of Lightning Ridge. It's a bit smaller, it's a bit rougher. The real reason, though, you fictionalise things is so you don't get sued for defamation because, you know, if the, if the mayor in the book's a crook, you want it not to be a real town. So anyway, in the book, there's this... Opal mining is... It's almost by legislation, is a small operation. You can only stake so much land, so they're all like one-man bands or brothers or partners, little partnership. So in the book, I, I, I create this, this religious organisation that's getting young people in and they're fronting for these claims. So they've got multiple claims that, that they're mining and they're, all the rest of the town hate them and all that. And, you know, where did it come from? It was just like a good idea. I, you know, just recently I found out there was actually a religious group in Lightning Ridge that actually does that. <laughs> I just, and I never heard of it. It's like, I'm going, are you kidding? Or is someone pulling my leg? But apparently. So there you go. There you go. Did you not go, God, I'm brilliant? <laughs> I'm thinking, they've stolen my idea. <laughs> I could have done that, I could be rich. I was just thinking, how long have they been there for? Do you reckon maybe they read the book and they set up or? <laughs> Well, actually, what gave me the idea is I was originally planning to go to South Australia. I had this idea for a book set in, in like one of those big global mines. But COVID came along and closed the borders. And then I saw a woman with an opal pendant. I went, opal mining town? I can have the big mine and the little mine. So I went up there. But there was this old church up there made out of corrugated iron. Looked absolutely rough of its guts. And it was because it had been made for a film set back like 20 years ago. I forget the name of the film. I, I don't, anyway, it was, it's just such a startling thing. Um, and that's what sort of triggered the idea of having this sort of religious cult up there and maybe some 
uh, there's a few scenes that you know got washed out uh, of the of the final book. But um, a mate went up only about six months afterwards, and, and he's a photographer. He said, "Where, where should I just take some photos?" I said, "Oh, the corrugated iron church." You know, going going anyway. It's gone. It's been demolished. So it sat there, sort of falling to bits. You know, 20 years after they'd made it for this film, it had no interior at all. It was just an you know exterior sort of shell. And then they bulldozed it. So by the, by the time the book came out, it was gone. And for another coincidence, that wasn't one of your films, was it, Brian? Uh, no, but I, 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 think I, might, I think I might know of that. Uh, uh, there's a couple of places I've been to where we film where there have been uh, um, uh, buildings built uh, and, a, and a church. I'm, I know that um, I shot a, a, a film called Sweet Country, um, indigenous film that Warwick Thornton did uh, out of Broken Hill. And we used as a, a section uh, a, 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 a little town that had been built for a film and they never made the film. But we were able to use it many years later. Um, so th those things do, do exist around the country where people have left a bit of a set or whatever. Earlier in the session, I said that I'd listened to Sweet Jimmy on audiobook. And um, as you might expect, I mean, the narration is, is terrific. The modulation's beautiful. And it really is like you're being told a story um, as, as, as you're asleep or as you're walking. Did you enjoy narrating the book that you'd written? I didn't even think about that. Uh, they, they, when they did the book, it was like, oh, right, OK, I've done the book. And they, they said, uh, now you've got to do the narration for the audiobook. And I went, well... Why do I have to do it? Don't, why, why, I guess someone said they said because uh, you've got to do it, <laughs> uh, and you know there was a part of me that sort of understood what they meant by that, but at the same time I thought there's no reason why someone else couldn't read this and make it make it work. So anyway, I, so I said all right, I'll, 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 yeah, okay, I'll do it. So I went into the studio, and um, I'd never done, I'd never, I mean, I've done voiceover for different things, and. <clears throat> I'm actually Dave the Goose for Air New Zealand commercials um, <laughs> and stuff like that, which is about the best job I've ever had in my life, um, being paid to be a goose. You know, when you're, when you're at school, you get called a goose so much, you know, like, you feel like turning around and going, hey, mate, now I get paid for it. Um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, um, uh, what was the question? Narrating. <laughs> oh, no. Narrating the book. I, I, guess, <laughs> I, just, I was just flying off there with a goose. Um, so, um, yeah, I hadn't done it before. So, th there's all the, the pages set down and I thought, this is going to be, you know, this is really quite scary because I, I didn't know, you know, you just, you just have to read. You know, you're reading, reading. You have no idea what the second line is, the third line is, the fourth line is. What? You're just, you're reading it and you've got to make sense of it as you're reading. Now, you know, I've done a lot of films and I've read a lot of scripts and I have to uh, play characters and all that. So, maybe, maybe I have a... I've developed a facility to be able to read and give comprehension to something that I haven't read before, even though I'd written it. I didn't remember what was there. So I was very worried that I'd start and within about four words stumble over a word. And I thought, my God, if I do this, this will take like a year to read the, to read the book if you're going to stumble over. And I was very, very surprised how I didn't and how actually not whipped through it but was able to quite easily want, go through it giving, uh, cr creating or talking about the character. I think the, thi I think the thing is with my stories is there's someone telling these stories. So in a way I was able to tell the story so that made it, made it easier. But you know every girl in it had my voice, every bloke in it had, mo had my voice. You know if there was a duck in it it would have had my voice. You know like you know I didn't try to put on some other voice for each character. Each character spoke like me but they were all different. Um, um, uh, and, and so I was very, I was very taken. What I did find was I'd finish one of the stories, and then I said to the bloke, "Make sure you send that to me." Like it took about four days to do. It. I said at the end of each day, I'd say, "Send me the audio of it um, so I can get it tonight, right?" And I would play it either that night or in the morning and listen to it. And in almost every case, I'd go, "Okay, I want to do the first two pages again." I, 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 I need, I, I needed to go. You're not. You're not. You're either racing too fast on this, but as, as it settled in, like th for two thirds, three quarters of it, it was all fine. But in many cases, I go no. You, you, you're 
just take your time more on this first section. You're, you're, you're hurrying too much. And that was the only change that I sort of felt. So it was very good to be able to... I, I was very pleased that I was smart enough to say, send it to me to listen to, to see if there is something I can do better in making this work, yeah. But uh, it, was, it was pretty enjoyable. I wouldn't do it again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, it's too hard, and, uh, and you know, like, because, uh, uh, well, I, I'm writing another book, which is a novel, I mean, if, uh, you know, I bet they say the same thing, that's if it ever gets published, but I mean, you know, like, the, the thought of actually doing, the thought of reading this of Chris's is a nightmare, <laughs> to go, like 500 pages, you know, you'll be there for six months. <laughs> How long's the tilt, Greg? How many pages? Well, p pages are deceptive, but uh, it's about the same length, I think, 120,000 words. Before I hand you over to our audience, Chris, um, Scrublands, your first book, has been optioned for the screen. Is that not right? Yes. Uh, so, so, look, as, as Brian would know all too well, when something gets optioned doesn't mean it's going to get made. It just gives them the exclusive rights to develop it which is getting writers on board, but more importantly, trying to get money and distribution and all that. It's got a couple of Australian production companies who are doing it, and the main one is uh, a mob called Easy Tiger. They're the people behind the Jack Irish series, which are, you know, the Peter Temple books. Um, fantastic, with, with uh, Guy Pearce. And they're the ones who did Rake as well. So it's in very good hands. It's progressing. I know one of the writers is on it, so fingers crossed, you know, there may be news in the next year or so. But it's a very... It's one thing about... You know, I worked in, in television in, like, news current affairs. One thing about writing a book, you can just sit down and do it by yourself. You can do it on the train, you can do it, you know, do it at a cafe. All those sort of backwards and forwards that goes on with television or film production... Yeah, you know, seems to take forever. Uh, so, so look, I think it's going to happen, but you know, until it does, you know, until they start filming, you never really know. Things can get canned at the last, like COVID did that to all sorts of productions, right? So, yeah, fingers crossed. Brian, now you've got a collection of short stories. Which short story is most likely to be headed for the screen? Do you think? is most likely to be made into a film or a series? Well, the, the A Time to Do, the one on Frank Testy, um, I'm developing that as a series um, with uh, the, the company that makes Mystery Road, um, who I did Dead, dead uh, no, um, Sweet Country with. So um, we're developing that. But once again, lo like what Chris says is, you know, it's a long journey. I mean, the longest journey is the writing of the piece. You know, like, and, 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 and Chris is right. You know, he can write his, his book in, in a year, but a screenplay will take at least four years. At least four years before you go, OK, this will now start to... This is now liable to start to get interest. But, you know, it, and it doesn't matter what you say and how many times you say this will be different, it's about four years before you start chasing the money. So that's just the name of the game. <clears throat> Watch this space. In the meantime, um, I'm going to ask for a show of hands of questions. Please wait for the roving mic to come around because we're being recorded. Thank you. There's a man in the front row and he is um, going to get a microphone now. Susan, I noticed that there's a few of your books there. Could you speak briefly on them? I could have put you in the audience myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris Hammer, who is holding up The Deceptions and The Teacher's Secret. Um, the Teacher's Secret is uh, a book about... a primary school teacher who is uh, forced into early retirement following allegations made against him. And it was inspired by the work I do on a tribunal uh, where I decide whether people should be working with children or not. And I find sometimes that the stories are more grey than they are black and white. And so this is a story of a community, uh, uh, a number of people in a community revolving around the school and their reactions um, when this man falls into apparent disrepute. And The Deceptions is my COVID book, <laughs> which came out the day we went into lockdown. And it's um, a story of um, Hannah, who during the war was Czech and was taken to a ghetto outside pa Prague called Theresienstadt. And there, a form of relationship begins with her guard 
and the book is the ramifications of that down the line. Thank you for your excellent question. <laughs> Another question. <laughs> God, we were that good. <laughs> <laughs> we we have we, we, we have a, have a woman down the front. Yes. Yeah, just wait, wait for the microphone. Thank you. Since there were no other questions, I I just wondered. Um, you mentioned four years for uh, screenwriting. Um, I, I thought there were some people that wrote uh, their books and the screenwriting at the same time. With all your experience, couldn't you do that? So, so, so could you not write a screenplay and a novel in tandem, so that, thus cutting the time needed? Yeah. I don't, I don't think I could write a screenplay. It's a whole other technique. Um, it's like, uh, like I, I produce movies where, I, where I'll come up with an idea, test it out, find a writer, work with a writer, move forward in that way. Um, and people say, well, do you want to direct? And I go, no, there's no way I could direct. It's a, you, know, you think they fall in the same area, but they're very, very different. And with a screenplay, it's really a, 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 it's a, it's a very, very different concept to... Um, like I was just, I'm just reading a screenplay on Boy Who, Boy Who Swallowed the Universe. Uh, and, 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 and I read the screenplays, uh, the, the, I read four hours, at six hours, I read four hours for, of it. And, and I, I, I've looked at it and I've gone, wow, and it's very, very good. And then I started to read Boy Who Swallows the Universe and I go, how the hell did the writer know where to start on this story? You know, like it's massive story, 800 pages or something like, where do you start from? What do you leave out? What do you put in? Um, and in a funny sort of way, um, and I've had it with, um, with uh, writers' books before, they say, no, I want to write the screenplay. They are too protective of that book. No, that's got to be in there. No, you can't, you know, you need someone that's from outside it looking at it and going, here's the things that will make the, 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 a film because not everything in the book will make the film. So it, for, for myself, I, w I wouldn't attempt it because I know I wouldn't be any good at it. Um, yeah, I know enough that I don't know, so I wouldn't want to be involved in the scripting of my books. I know the, the lead writer personally, she, um, we're, we're, we're friends. She wrote uh, the first few Underbelly series. She wrote and produced Pine Gap. You know, she's very experienced writing. She said, look, the book is great and I know, like all writers, you want us to be loyal to the book, but understand this, the book is told, apart from the prologue, it's told exclusively from Martin Skarsden's point of view. And so you're seeing the world through his eyes, but the camera doesn't operate like that. Mm. You can do scenes, point of, point of view, camera point of view, but it gets very tired very quickly. So the camera's gonna be more objective, which means having scenes where you don't, like you don't know where Martin's thinking, obviously, but there'll be scenes where he's not present, where in the book, to, to, make, to make the story flow properly, and I don't know, I don't think I could step, you know, as Brian says, I don't think I could step back far enough to do that, so you're better off giving to people who have been doing it for years and are at the top of their game. Yeah. Before I take a next question, just quickly about the um, Boy Swallows universe. I think John Colley is one of the writers on that. He wrote them. He's written them all, yeah. And um, he, he loves the Central Coast. He spends a lot of time here. He's a friend of mine. And um, also, while we're on the Central Coast, a number of your stories, or at least um, the Sweet Jimmy stories, take place in the Central Coast. In, in the Central Coast, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah my, my nephew uh, lived at Warrumbul, um, at Wombrel, and... Um, uh, Funny name, isn't it? Very hard, very hard if you only say it like twice a year. You, can, you know, <laughs> Warrumble, Wumble. Anyway, good name though. Um, and so I wanted to write, you know, like, I, I, and he's very, he's very close to me, and he, he, he's, he and his young family moved here, and I, and I, I wanted to, and that, that made me go, no, I want to do something about the Central Coast, you know, like it's a big part of Australia, big part of New South Wales. So you'll recognise <clears> a lot of it. We have a question, thank you, at the front again. I'll just wait for the microphone. Just curious, once you've sold the rights to your book, 
do have to totally let go of and put it into the hands of that writer. And, and you know, are, are you then consulted um, at the end of that? Um, so you can say, well, I want this or want that in it. Look, if they want to consult me, for example, sometimes you get a book and it turns into an eight-part series, they've got to introduce new storylines. So um, Candace Fox's book, Crimson Lake, was just on TV as Troppo. It's an eight one-hour thing, and the book isn't that big. So they've done all sorts of, taken all sorts of liberties. They, um, so there's, the op there's a whole lot of lines in the contract about being consulted and that, but the last line is, you know, in the event of any you know, dispute or something, the producer has the last say. So that's, so the short answer is no, you got no control. <laughs> Which is very sensible of them. Did you want to add anything to that, Brian? No, but all, all that's true. But I mean, it, you know, it is a collaborative process. You do, you know, first of all, you've loved the person's story that laid down. So you, it's not as though you want to make it some other story. You know, you, you, want, to, you, want, to, you, 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 you want to make that story come alive with, with characters uh, the, the, portrayed on the screen. So you, you're doing everything. But there's areas where you go, as you say, there's going to be scenes in there that, have, w w that aren't in the book. Um, but, you know, like, it, it, it is collaborative and you will, you, you know, the more that you talk within the people that love the story, the more things will come out that you can use. So, um, but when, 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 when you know, some, the, the buck has to stop somewhere and so in everything. So in, in, in making a movie, they end up with the rights, the buck stops there, you know. The, the other thing I should add there is writing books uh, is not a solitary process. It is collaborative as well. So every word in our books are our words, but there's a very important editing process you go through, which is you do a big structural edit, then you do a copy edit, you do a proof edit, and the people who work at edit my books are, you know, the best in Australia, they're some of the best in the world, and I'm so lucky to work with them. So how stupid would I have to be not to listen to those editors when they say, look, it's this bit, it's just a bit slow here, or I don't quite see why you've put that in there, or, hey, maybe wouldn't it be better if you switched those two chapters around, something like that. It's always suggestions, they never just do it, you know, unless it's a, you know, an obvious spelling mistake or something like that. So already in books, it is a collaborative, it is a collaborative process, and any writer who gets too attached to their own, you know, their own brilliance, not to listen to their editors, as the writer's just going to, you know, do a, do a face plant, I figure. Was that your experience too, Brian, that the writing um, process was collaborative? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the great thing about um, the developing a, a story is that, it, it, that it, you've got the director, you've got the writer, and if it's come from a, from a book, you've got uh, th that writer's input as well. So, you know, in, in trying to get to that place that's going to end up be the film. It's, it, 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 it's frustrating, but it's exciting, and it's, uh, there's passion in there because everyone wants that thing to get there. So, you know, it's a, it's, a joyful pla it's a joyful place to be with all the frustrations and the rest of it that goes on, you know, and the arguments, you know, and, uh, and, and yeah, we'll leave it at arguments. <laughs> yeah. And we'll leave it at that. Oh, thank you very much to my guests, Brian Brown and Chris Hammer. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to audio. Thank you to the committee of Words on the Waves. Please, um, please don't go away. Um, Brian and Chris will be signing their books. And if there are questions that you didn't quite get to ask, that's your time. Thank you.